Hey guys, welcome to my channel or welcome back. One of the most popular videos on my channel is my homeschooling while working video and it's pretty old. I want to say it's from like 2015-16 um, and things are a little different now. Right now, as of filming, we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic around the world. So maybe you're watching this video because you are now thrown into homeschooling but you're still working and you're trying to figure out stuff or maybe being thrown into it you were like, huh, I can maybe do this. So anyway, even if you are here in the future, because like I said, that video is still the most popular on my channel or one of the most popular on my channel, even though it's pretty old. So even if you're here in the future and you're like, I remember those times, um, <laughs> welcome and I hope this video will help you out in your journey to homeschooling. So a little bit about me. I am a certified teacher in Canada. I teach kindergarten. I've t taught kindergarten the majority of my career but I have experience with all ages and grades, um, both in Canada and internationally as well. And I have loved homeschooling a lot of <laughs> my life. <laughs> Majority of my life I've been interested in homeschooling um, and have done a lot of research in homeschooling. When I first recorded my other video, I did not have a child and I still do not have a child home. Um, I am in the process of adopting. So. My daughter is two years old and has developmental delays and so going forward with my thoughts and stuff like that with what I plan on doing for homeschooling, it is with her in mind. So um, for this video what I plan on doing is I'm going to talk a little bit about like a generalization about an area of homeschooling while working and then I'm going to talk about my specifics of what I plan on doing. So. For those that just want general information, it'll be there, but then also those that are following my channel for my journey and stuff, I'm also going to talk specifics about my daughter and my plans with that. I'm going to link down below some um, timestamps because I'm sure this video is probably going to get pretty long, and if there's an area that you just kind of want to quick little click over to, you can go check that out. If there's anything that you'd love to see a more in-depth topic um, video on, let me know and I can do that as well. So anyway, let's get started. So the first step if you are looking into homeschooling while you are working or homeschooling in general is you need to find out about your local laws. Everywhere is different, every state is different, every country is different. Um, I live in Canada and every province is different and what your legal requirements are or if you can even legally homeschool, you need to check in those, those, um, those aspects. What age you have to enroll your child if you have to enroll them. Um, if you have to give notification to a school board or anything like that, check in your local laws because I obviously don't know your local laws at all. Um, some are more um, lenient, like Ontario. If you have a child that is not six years old yet, you never have to enroll them. And any, <laughs> nothing. You don't need just paperwork, nothing. Um, if you are pulling your child from school, you do have to give notice to the school board. Here in Alberta, you don't have to do anything until they're six years old, um, but you do have to enroll in a school board as a homeschooling family. Um, but there's benefits to that as well. In Ontario, you get no funding. Alberta, we get um, we do get some funding for homeschooling materials and stuff um, with the trade-off that we have some accountability where we need to... Um, we need to provide like a, a plan for the year and then later in the year you do a follow-up meeting as well. So you have two meetings a year, trade-off is you get some funding. Um, me as a teacher personally, I like that accountability because I find that um, there's a lot of homeschooling parents out there, especially in the unschooling world, that don't actually school at all, that use homeschooling as basically a free-range parenting method that they let their kids do whatever they want. Um, which my parenting philosophy is that, teach their own, but anyway, um, I feel like we are doing a disservice to students um, and children around the world by not requiring um, homeschooling parents to have any accountability, because at the end of the day, children need to know how to read and write and do basic math. Beyond that, educate your child however you feel like it, but please teach your child to read, write, and do basic math. Anyway, on to the next area, your why. After you figure out your laws, <laughs> you have to really think about your why. Why do you want to homeschool? Especially as a working parent, you know it's going to be more challenging than if you are not working. So why do you want to homeschool your child? Um, are they having troubles in school? Um, are you anticipating troubles in school? Um, maybe you're like me and you have a child that has some developmental delays that you don't feel the public school system can accommodate. Um, basically just think about why you want to homeschool and think about is that stress of homeschooling going to outweigh 
the stress of enrolling them in a school. So this is where I have um, flip-flopped multiple times with what I want to do with my daughter. And at the end of the day, I feel like it's one of those things where my why is going to change every year. Well, maybe not my why, but my my the weight of that is going to change every year where maybe at some point, maybe she's in grade four and I'm I'm at that point where homeschooling her is way more stressful than the stress I would be facing if I enrolled her in public school. So I think the whys or the balances need to be reevaluated every year, but they might be something that you're like, nope, I'm pulling my child or I'm not having my child in school. Um, maybe you don't live in an area that has very good schools. Um, maybe safety is a concern for you. Um, whatever your reason is, that needs to be a focus to keep in mind as you're going through the planning process and as you're thinking about the different styles and stuff like that because you need to know what your specific child is like and what what your reasoning is for wanting to homeschool otherwise you won't be able to make that connection to figure out um, the rest of everything else. The next part is child care. So if you are working obviously you are not taking your child to work with you unless maybe you are maybe you're a business owner and you can ch take your child to work um and that's amazing if you can but for i think the majority of people watching this video myself um we are working outside of the home um or we maybe people are working in the home but in like a home office um and maybe also still need some sort of child care on top of that but the majority of people i think are working outside the home and need external child care so maybe your partner is working an opposite shift than you and they can watch the child while you're at work and then you watch them while they're at work. Maybe you have um, family that can watch your child or maybe you have to roll them in um, a daycare facility. The daycare facility I think is the hardest once they hit that school age because some daycare facilities will not accept children over a certain age um, or will only accept them part-time um, and then like in my case, where my daughter has developmental delays, it is challenging to find a daycare provider um, in general, but then I can't foresee me being able to find a daycare provider that's going to take an eight-year-old with developmental delays, um, those types of things. So if you have options in your area, such as like a home daycare or a day home, um, check into those. That's kind of my plan. They're smaller, they have fewer children, and because they're usually either private or under some sort of umbrella company, they tend to be able to accept children um, beyond what's the typical. So for them to take a nine-year-old child, they can probably do that. For me, having a child with special needs and having um, other external factors in terms of um, our family and our family building, it is important to me for her to have a smaller setting with fewer caregivers and fewer children. So for me, I'm looking into either a day home for her, a home daycare, or ideally, um, my mom will be able to, to um, be my child care provider. If you have a family member or your partner able to um, be your child care, it's also quite beneficial because you're also able to get in a little bit more homeschooling, which we'll talk about in a little bit about the scheduling, but you're able to squeeze in a little bit more um, maybe academic work during that day, especially if it's your partner, um, because they should be sharing the load. Um, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you don't want them to. Um, but they can definitely take on a little bit of the homeschooling portion, um, and it just makes it a little bit easier. A larger daycare facility is probably not able to do that, um, whereas a smaller daycare or like a home daycare could probably do a little bit if they're not doing it already, which I'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about schedules. So now you know a little bit about your laws, you know what kind of child care you're going to kind of go with, you um, know your your why of why you want to homeschool, and now you can think about what styles of homeschooling you like. There is a wide range of homeschooling styles from home at school at home, so basically doing exactly what you would be doing at a school, but doing it in your house. So usually like a structured curriculum, um, possibly through your school board. Um, or like online learning through your school board or your state or whatever. Um, or you could be going all the way to the other end, which is unschooling, which is basically just letting your child learn as they go, not having a set curriculum, not really having a set plan. Your child is completely in control of their learning, completely in control of their schedule, completely in control of everything. So in the middle of that, there's a bunch of other styles. Um, there's some that are like unit studies, where it's basically like a thematic unit that you're going through. Um, there's other curriculums that you can purchase or um, find online. 
there's stuff like Charlotte Mason where you are um, you have like your set style but your resources are up to you um, and there's like just a wide range of different eclectic styles and whatnot so there is a quiz that I found that I'm gonna try to post if I remember the link for it down below it kind of will give you an idea of what you would like to do. So originally back in the day when I originally found homeschooling I thought homeschooling was school at home. Basically you just recreate the classroom in your in your home and I've slowly gone around different ways. Um, unit studies I really liked um, because I teach kindergarten so I do a lot of thematic units and stuff like that because that's what works for my grade with my classroom with my 25 students. But um, learning more about unschooling and how children learn and um, kind of that like following the child's lead a little bit more and knowing that my daughter has developmental delays so she will never probably be on the same her her chronological age will never match her academic age so I have fallen more into a Charlotte Mason little bit unschooling kind of um, area. I definitely love Charlotte Mason um, I highly recommend checking it out. I um, am not Christian. It is originally a very Christian program. I am not Christian, but there is Wildwood Wild Wood curriculum, which is like a secular Charlotte Mason curriculum, and it's totally free online, um, and it's very much about using um, more like classical literature, quality, class, quality uh, materials of different books and um, music and whatnot, and not having... Uh, what she refers to as twaddle, so not having like those kind of fluffy, uh, dumbed down kind of stuff for children. So, um, highly recommend you take that quiz and see um, what kind of style you are like leaning towards because it's definitely helpful to know what you want to kind of get out of your education and it has to fit your style because like for me to do school at home knowing that it doesn't fit my style, it's just going to create more stress. I don't want to be spending a ton of money on curriculum that's just just for me to follow but I'm also a teacher so for me I feel more comfortable with some other styles because of the fact that I have I have that child education background I have the child development background um, I know the curriculum <laughs> because that's my job um, whereas someone else that's maybe uh, a little bit newer to homeschooling a little newer to education in general might feel more comfortable following a curriculum so definitely take that quiz and see which style works best for you and then research it. Don't, you don't have to commit to one style. If you say I am going to do um, <laughs> unschooling, you don't have to commit to unschooling your entire child's entire career of education. Um, and you don't have to be like, oh, I'm going to do unit studies and only unit studies. You can do a little bit of unit studies, a little bit of unschooling. There's no, there's no like homeschooling police that are going to be like, you aren't following Charlotte Mason exactly. Therefore, you cannot do Charlotte Mason. There's no one that's going to be like that. If they are, they shouldn't be because that's not, we should be homeschooling however we homeschool the best. So once you've kind of figured out your style, hopefully your style has also helped you figure out what subjects you value the most. So <laughs> the reason I say that is because um, like unschooling tends to be very free flowing where there's no focus on specific subjects. Whereas something like um, like unit studies focuses on math, literacy, science, social. Um, Charlotte Mason focuses mostly on math, on literacy with a little bit of math, a little bit of science and social, and a lot on, um, how do I put it, like the arts, like nature studies and um, music and stuff like that. And also Charlotte Mason focuses on other stuff that aren't technically subjects, such as having good habits and handicrafts. So by finding your style, you should hopefully be able to figure out what subjects you want to teach. Um, maybe you want to add in some religion content, depending on your belief systems. Maybe you want to, um, you know what you want your child to learn in life, and therefore you can kind of gear it towards them. So for me, with my child having um, developmental delays, my goal for her in life is maybe a little bit different than if I had a typical child. So I... Um, if she wants to attend post-secondary, good for her, but if not, I'm okay with that. Whereas if you are, you know you want your child to take post-secondary, you might have to gear their education a little bit differently, especially depending on your laws and the um, 
the requirements in order to go to post-secondary for your area because there might be certain subjects that you have to focus on a little bit stronger, say, say science or social, in order for them to be able to pursue post-secondary later on. Um, so not necessarily saying, okay, you're six-year-old, you firmly have to know exactly what their life plan is, but just having an idea of where you want to go with things um, throughout your education. So for my daughter, my focus will be on math, literacy, um, and life skills. So literacy, reading, writing, speaking. <laughs> um, for her, she um, will have speech delays as well. So we will be working on stuff like sign language. For math, I don't care if she can calculate the area of something. I would like her to be able to count, subtract, <laughs> add addition and subtraction, and basic um, time and money skills. Those are what I plan on focusing on for math skills for my daughter. Anything beyond that, obviously I want her to know her shapes, like the basic, very basic stuff, but I don't need her to know how to calculate angles of things. If she becomes interested in that, then great. And that's kind of where my unschooling thinking comes in, because unschooling kind of follows the, um, the interest of the child. So if for some reason she decides she wants to build a birdhouse, and we need to figure out some angles and we need to figure out some measurements, then we will work on that as we go. But in terms of like, I must teach her addition, subtraction, time and money. The other thing I want her to learn is our life skills. So that's the habit forming portion of Charlotte Mason, where how to do laundry, how to cook a meal. Um, and that's where some measurement math comes in. And that's where some subjects kind of blend in with life. Um, but those are the kind of things that I'm focusing on with my daughter. You need to sit down and think about what you want to focus on with your child. Um, and each child might be individual too. You might have five kids and each child you have different goals for them. And that's where you need to kind of think about what you want to teach, where the overlap is, um, and what ages you have of your children that might be able to, to be able to... Um, that this child can do this independently while I work on this, or maybe you're doing a life skill of cooking and you can cook as a whole family. So, but just knowing like what your style is and then knowing what subjects you want to focus on in that will help you figure out your scheduling and stuff like that after. So this next section is going to be long and <laughs> I thought about doing a whole separate video in it and about it and maybe I will later, but I wanted to include it in this to show you how easy it is to get school in your day. Working parents are like, oh, I'm going to work all day. My kids in childcare all day. How the heck do I fit a school day in? Um, so most children go to school for about six hours ish. Um, I have actual like numbers written down. So I'm this is going to be a longer section because I'm going to be actually saying numbers and kind of giving some comparisons to school life and homeschool life, um, and specifically homeschool life while in a childcare facility during the, the day. Um, it could be in the evening as well, depending on your work schedule, but basically not having that set time of being like, hey, this is my child's full school day. So um, I am going by my specific school, <laughs> my specific province. Um, I pulled, my schedule is a bit different in kindergarten because we are required less minutes and our schedule times are different. So anyway, so I pulled up the older grade stuff and kind of did a comparison with um, across the grades to see. So this is for elementary school. They have scheduled in their day 60 minutes of math, 30 minutes of social studies, um, so that's like history, geography, um, 90 minutes of literacy, 30 minutes of science, and then depending on the day of the week, um, 30 minutes of either music, gym, or art. Um, then they have 30 minutes of what's called response to intervention, which is basically the doing um, small group work with individual students or small groups of students that are struggling with certain things or groups of students that you're trying to bump up. Usually it's the students that are struggling um, because they need some more small group because most of our classes are at least 25 students. So it's really hard for individual students to that are struggling to have that one-on-one -on -one on tension, and that's where we do the response to intervention groups. So anyway, I then narrowed that down <laughs> even further. So that was actual like scheduled times. I'm gonna take off 10 minutes for each one for five minutes to set up and five minutes to clean up. 
So 50 for math, 20 for social, 80 for literacy, 20 for science, 20 for music, gym, or art, and 20 for response to intervention. In a whole week, <laughs> that equals 250 minutes of math, because five days in a week, 250 minutes for math, 100 minutes for social studies, um, 400 minutes for literacy, 100 minutes for science, and then um, 100 minutes for music or gym or art, um, and then 100 minutes for response to intervention. Now, I don't know about you, but my weeks have seven days in it. <laughs> and I work five days of that. So I feel like a lot of homeschooling parents that are working should be using the weekends to their advantage, whether that is catching up on something that they didn't get done on the week, uh, during the week, or if they are um, doing more focus lessons on the weekends and then during the week kind of doing more review stuff. Anyway, use the weekends. So if you divide those school instructional times by seven instead of five, 35 minutes a day for math, 15 minutes a day for social studies, 60 minutes a day for literacy, 15 minutes a day for science, 15 minutes a day for music, gym, or art. And then you don't need response to intervention at all because you're doing it already. When you're focusing on, unless you have 25 kids, you are already doing response to intervention because you are focusing on your individual child. And even if you did have 25 kids, they're not all the same age, and you're not teaching the same thing to every single one of them. So as homeschooling parents, you are already ch taking out a huge chunk of that by not actually needing to do that. So, <laughs> as we continue, um, this is where the, the overall minutes come in. So, depending on what subjects you want, so like Charlotte Mason, for instance, like I said, I'll be focusing mostly on literacy, and um, she recommends very short lessons, so 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes max, especially in elementary. So I wouldn't be doing, like, they do 90 minutes of literacy scheduled, um, and then if I pair that down to seven days a week, that would be 60 minutes of literacy. I would not be doing a 60-minute literacy lesson, and that's how a lot of schools do it, where they do, um, one school I was at was 100 minutes of literacy straight. <laughs> there was no break, no anything. They might have had like quick brain breaks, but it was 100 minutes of literacy without having time to actually process. So most homeschool families, I feel, don't do that unless the kids are older. Um, they would break it out throughout their day. And when I talk in a bit about some scheduling ideas, you'll see how it's easy to fit into your day. So anyway, so students at my specific school are in the school from, from bell to bell, obviously, transitioning out and transitioning in for 405 minutes a week minimum out of that 270 minutes are actually scheduled curriculum times out of that 270 curriculum times because obviously you need to take out recesses transition times um, we have actual transition time scheduled in our day and lunch and stuff like that um so out of that, uh, 210 of that is actual instructional time. And that's with not including interruptions. Um, <laughs> students being called to the office, um, students going to the bathroom, having issues with technology um, or supplies or anything like that. But that is like actual, just general, 210 minutes of instructional time a week. If you do that by seven days, you only need 140 homeschool hours, which works out to about 2.3 hours a day. So, here's the thing though. Here's the thing. If you don't follow a school schedule of September to June or August to May, wherever you're living, um, with having holidays off and like two weeks for Christmas and spring break and all those breaks, um, you can actually get a lot more in in shorter amount of time um, in a day. So for instance, my school board, we have a hundred and I want to say it was like 181 actual instructional days, but that varies based off of the school year. Um, I put down 185 because I feel like 185 instructional days is what we usually do. 
So that's not, that's including days like field trips, assemblies, sports days, all those kind of things that don't aren't actual instructional, like instructional time. Obviously during a field trip, I feel like students learn stuff. I feel like during sports days, students are learning stuff. But in terms of actual instructional academic, like you sitting down and learning things, um, that's, that's obviously less than 185 days. But anyway, I made that into minutes, of course. Uh, 38,850, so 38850 minutes in a school year. If we divide that by 365, this year 366, um, but 365, it works out to be 107 um, minutes a day that you would need to homeschool your child, which is actually less than two hours, about half an hour less per day that you would need to do. So instead of 2.3 um, 2 hours a day, you would need to do 1.78 hours a day. <laughs> But sticking with like a two hour a day kind of thing, you could easily do, I'm going by a work day where you work during the day. If you work during the evening, this would kind of flip. Um, but basically, 30 minutes before you go to work, having your child care provider do 30 minutes of work, and then doing 60 minutes of work once you're home. Now you're probably like, okay, I'm not gonna be able to get stuff done on weekends, um, I don't wanna do stuff on weekends, or I, there's no way I can fit 30 minutes in before work. There's no way I can get my child care provider to do 30 minutes. You're probably thinking a million things. But here's the thing. There is so much stuff that can be counted as education. Playing outside can be counted as gym. Um, any games that they play, whether that is at home or at um, your child care provider, is learning. If you are reading together, read a story together in the morning or before bed. There's some literacy. Guaranteed your child care provider can read a story aloud to your child. Guaranteed that. Um, if you're doing cooking, you're doing some measurement, there's some math. Um, if you go to a religious service on a weekend or during the week, there's some social studies because you're learning about a religion. M most places do music, I think. I don't know, but I think most <laughs> services have some sort of music or some sort of re uh, reciting something there's some literacy. If they are learning something to recite, there's some literacy. Um, if you go out camping and hiking in the summer, there's so many skills. There's survival skills. Hiking is physical activity. You might be doing some measurement to see if your tent will fit somewhere. There might be cooking skills. Um, even stuff like packing for a vacation is a lot of like logical skills of how much can we fit? Will it be too much weight? Um, how many clothes do we need for the trip? If we're going for seven days, how many pairs of socks do we need? Those are all skills and, and like learning, important learning skills. If you go to a museum, you got some science, you got some social studies there. Um, going to a play, you might have some literacy. If it's like a, a play that you've studied for literacy, you go to the play on the weekend and that's counting as your literacy. Obviously, it's dr uh, dramatic arts, might have some music in it. Disney on ice, music, <laughs> um, even just talking to your child. Um, so many studies are showing that we are struggling with oral language where students and children are not learning how to talk um, because parents are not speaking to their children and speaking is happening later and later. So even just talking with your child, asking them questions. So what did you do at your childcare today? Um, what was your favorite part of the story? What was the story about? Stuff like that is all important oral language that they need to develop. Them talking to anyone is oral language. So if they are sitting at daycare, building, a, doing a puzzle, there you go, you got some logic skills going on there. And then on top of that, they're talking to the kid beside them, there's some oral language. Um, if they're building something, there's some problem solving, there's some math maybe involved. Um, maybe they're seeing how big they could build something. There might be some STEM involved. Um, I, I'm going to put this part in moderation, but educational games that are like electronic, not necessarily like board games and stuff like that. Board games and stuff like that fall under the playing games part for me. But educational games in moderation, like if you're making supper or you have a household task you need to get done, um, like for a short time, I'm saying like less than an hour, um, you can get some, maybe some STEM in there, like coding, stuff like that. You can get math, literacy, 
um, art and everything in there's so many different games out there I personally love Osmo O S M O because they are hands-on games so you basically you have your tablet um, I have a Kindle Fire for my daughter and then it uses like this little mirror thing and then she can play with the pieces and like the I really want to get eventually the preschool one where she will build letters with it with like I don't know these shape pieces and um, but it's like interactive um, it's way beyond what she can do right now but I have had fun playing with it but there's games for that like um, there's like a pizza one where you build pizzas and you do you calculate change like money change and stuff like that and what I like with the Osmo games is you can go very 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 easy and basic or you can go way up and make it hard like I <laughs> my math is not great because I teach kindergarten <laughs> So I like to play the games to build up some math skills. So you can definitely use the games for a long time. And I like it because it's hands-on. If you're going to choose games, please don't choose like those twaddly ones. Like, I hate to say it, but some of the Disney ones or like, I don't know what, what are popular these days. But just those annoying ones. Don't choose those ones. Choose actual quality, quality games that involve like actual thinking not just touching something and it's saying the letter name and sound but actually having something more hands-on having something that they actually have to do so anyway now that you have a little bit of ideas on what exactly education might look like what you can actually do in your day so like I said that 30 minutes before work that might be as simple as you reading a story to your child maybe you have an audiobook you listen to an audiobook while you are having breakfast. There's some literacy. Your child is at child care and they are doing a puzzle. They get a story read to them. Maybe they sing a little song, depending on their age, of course. Maybe they're reading independently. Or at a certain age, I'm pretty sure you can send some work with them. I wouldn't send anything that they that you haven't taught yet but sending something like um, a novel that they're working on. Literacy, I think, is one of the easiest ones, or science and social, where it's something that they can read because they should be able to read independently at a certain age, and therefore that's something that the child care provider doesn't even have to do with them. Um, but they're still playing. Maybe they're playing outside and they're getting some physical activity. And then when you come home, that's when I would be doing the actual formal lessons. After supper, make sure everyone's fed. <laughs> So they're not grumpy. Maybe you cook with them for a little bit. Maybe that counts as some of your math for that day. And then you do 30 minutes of actual instructional time. And then maybe you talk about your day. You listen to some music. You read a story and you go to bed. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated. And then on weekends you can do your... your um, you go to your religious service. And then you read for a little bit. And then you play a board game together and then you do a formal math lesson um, for 15-20 minutes. There's your day. Like it is not hard to fit in those minutes if you're comparing it to a public school system where you're like oh I don't know how I'm gonna fit this all in my day. Once you've figured all that stuff out go back to your why and what subjects you want to teach, um, your style of teaching and make some sort of plan. Make kind of like a long-range plan of maybe five things that you want your child to learn in the day or in the year and then narrow that down to what's one thing that we're going to work on for this month. Maybe it's one literacy thing, one math thing, one science slash social, social thing and just focus on those for the month. Um, you don't need to do anything super complicated. Just try it out. See how things work. Don't set anything in stone. Things are going to evolve. That might be a day-to-day -day change. That might be a month-to-month -month change. That might be a year-to-year -year change. For me, my plan is to go with the flow. <laughs> I will have a year plan because I'm a teacher and that's what I'm used to doing. Um, and also legally I will have to because that's what my province requires. But um, every year I will be evaluating, is homeschooling working for us? What do I need to change? What do I need to add? What do I need to remove? Um, what does she need more of? What does she need less of? Those types of things. So just be prepared to reevaluate. But once you have all the pieces together, start to formulate some sort of plan. Once you have your plan in place, check out some resources. So for me personally, um, I find that I like the, um, the core knowledge series. There's like a whole series from I've seen preschool to grade six. I haven't seen beyond grade six, but um, there's books on, uh, it's all like, I can't remember what it's called, 
things your preschooler needs to know, stuff, something like that. What, what your preschooler needs to know. It's, it, if you search for like core knowledge series, I'll try to make a link down below if I can remember. Um, but basically it is a series of books that kind of goes over some important stuff for your child to learn. Mind you, I'm in Canada and it's very American focused in terms of the history portion. Um, but like for instance, there's one section that's like um, for the history, they should know about your country. Well, I can easily modify that to be like, she should know about our country um, or like about your flag. Okay, well, she should know about the Canadian flag, not the American flag. Um, there's other portions that are world history and stuff like that. And I feel like that's valuable for any child. Um, and it gives kind of like basics for math, basics for literacy. Kind of just gives you like a starting off point. The best part is the ebooks are pretty cheap, like 15 bucks Canadian. So it's not like you're paying hundreds of dollars for curriculum that you don't even actually need. <laughs> um, another thing that I really like for math is jump math. It's completely free. Um, I use it in my classroom and it's not the easiest to adapt for homeschooling, but if you're looking for a free math program, jump math, J-U-M-P math.org. Um, there's Canadian and there's American. Um, there's also like the curriculum outcomes. So if you're looking to try to stick with somewhat with the curriculum outcomes for your child's grade, um, go check that out. Um, if you are into Charlotte Mason stuff, there's stuff like um, the book called For For the Children's Sake. Um, I mean, there's a whole series of books for about Charlotte Mason, but that one's a really good one. Also, How Children Learn by John Holt, I think is his name. <laughs> she probably should have wrote it down. Um, but that one kind of goes over how children's brains work um, and kind of gives you an idea of um, why why school might not be the best setting for how your child's brain works. Um, the Whole Brain Child is another great one. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I should have wrote them down, but I didn't. Um, Home Learning Year by Year is a fantastic book. I have the second one, the second edition one. There's also some um, great books about like just general um, year by year like book book reading ones. <laughs> I really should have wrote this down. I have notes and I did not write down anything in terms of resources. I just wrote down resources. Anyway, there's so many resources out there that are either cheap or free. I'm hesitant to say do any type of curriculum. I would do what feels best for you um, because it's your child and your family. I would not recommend going out and purchasing like years and years and years worth of curriculum. I would try out one year um, and then see from there. So like Matthew C, I've seen really recommended. Um, Write Math, I think is the one that I'm thinking of doing with my daughter. I have a lot of stuff on Pinterest. <laughs> but go through, find resources, find what works best for you um, and your family. And if your child does have a special need, reach out to families and check online for families that have children with that specific special need and how they are teaching their child at home with that special need because what, what program works for one child might not work for your child. Um, so just check out with other families what works best for you. So anyway, hope this was helpful for you. It's a pretty long video, but I knew it would be. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions or if there's anything else you want me to specifically talk about. But basically, you can do it. You don't need that much time in your day. And at the end of the day, your child is gonna learn it all their life. <laughs> it's not like this whole learning starts at 8.30 and ends at 3. That's not how life works at all. I'm still learning. You're still learning. Guarantee your child is going to continue learning throughout life. So I would rather have my child love learning and not be so focused on getting assignments done and tests and assessments and all that stressors to do with school and my stress to go along with it. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys later. Bye guys.